So you're dealing with an addicted generation. This is a big time bomb ticking. This is no accident. Indeed, it is by design. I mean, seriously? It was my mistake. I mean, I think we can all feel it. To try to make these products as addictive as possible. spike in dopamine. You know, we now know that many of the major social media companies hire individuals called attention engineers who borrow principles from Las Vegas casino gambling, among other places, to try to make these products as addictive as possible. That is the desired use case of these products, is that you use it in an addictive fashion because that maximizes the profit that can be extracted from your attention and data. It literally is a point now where I think we have created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. That is truly where we are. The way the technologist Jaron Lanier puts it is that these companies offer you shiny treats in exchange for minutes of your attention and bytes of your personal data, which can then be packaged up and sold. What happened is that the attention economy and this race for attention got more and more competitive. And the more competitive it got to get people's attention on, say, a news website, the more they need to add these design principles, these more manipulative design tactics, as ways of holding on to your attention. You don't realize it, but you are being programmed. Social media tools are designed to be addictive. The actual design desired use case of these tools is that you fragment your attention as much as possible throughout your waking hours. That's how these tools are designed to use. Well, we have a growing amount of research which tells us that if you spend large portions of your day in a state of fragmented attention, so large portions of your day where you're constantly breaking up your attention, take a quick glance, do a just check, and just quickly look at Instagram, that this can permanently reduce your capacity for concentration. I am especially worried about this when we look at the younger generation coming up, which is the most saturated in this technology. And it's very addictive because if you pull on the slot machine arm enough, you will win. And you never know which poll will reward you. That's in your profile photo. And we, it knows that we'll be vulnerable to that moment because we all really care about when we're tagged in a photo or when we have a new profile photo. And the thing is that they control the dial, the technology companies control the dial for when and how long your profile photo shows up on other people's news feeds. So they can orchestrate it so that other people more often end up liking your profile photo over a delayed period of time, for example, so that you end up uh, having to more frequently come back and see what the new likes are. And it's literally rewiring our brain. Even social media, the challenges, you know, with these terms like Facebook depression and everything. Cause What's that? This is social media depression because where it's everyone's looking at their feed and they're comparing their lives to other people, the, their highlights of other people's lives. Wow. And there's actually less satis life satisfaction, more sadness, depression, and stuff like that. And it's interesting because if you think about things like things that, you know, routinely produce a lot of dopamine, alcohol, for example, there's a drinking age, right? We have a drinking age. The alcohol releases a whole lot of dopamine. It makes you feel really, really good. We say, okay, you can have that, but you've got to wait. You've got to be 21 years old. We don't do that with social media. We're, you know, essentially putting highly addictive drugs into the hands of kids before they have any natural defenses against them. And what you're seeing with internet addiction, with social media addiction, is the same thing over and over. It's people trying to change their state of consciousness with a device trying to get at the underlying neurochemical chemistry and it's very very addictive and so i would say the problem with the gadgets and i mean they're amazing things is that they interfere with they approximately interfere with medium to long-term goals i would say and so i think the first thing you have to do to bring them under control is figure out what it is that their use is interfering with it has to be something important so you think, well, I, I, I want to do something important. Well, what is that? Oh, it could be personal. Maybe you want to have a relationship. You want to get married. You, you want to have kids. You want to have a career that's meaningful. You know, you want to have a life. You, you want to have an Abrahamic adventure and be the father of nations, let's say. Well, you can't be ratting away on your cell phone and doing that. And so I think, I think part of it is to set your sights high and, and make a plan and figure out who you could be and see if obsessive utilization of smartphone fits into that vision of nobility. And it will partly because they're, they're unbelievably powerful communication devices, but so, so often it's, it's for lack of something better to do, and it also interferes. 
You know, Im imagine like when you take that to the extreme, where you know bad actors can now manipulate large swaths of people to do anything you want. It's just a it's a really really bad state of affairs, and we compound the problem, right? We curate our lives around this perceived sense of perfection because we get rewarded in these short-term signals, hearts, likes, thumbs up, and we conflate that with value and we conflate it with truth. And instead what it really is is fake brittle popularity. That's short-term and that leaves you even more and admit it vacant and empty before you did it. Because then it forces you into this vicious cycle where you're like what's the next thing I need to do now? Because I need it back. Think about that compounded by 2 billion people and then think about how people react then to the perceptions of others. It's just a it's a really bad. So we know from the research literature that the more you use social media, the more likely you are to feel lonely or isolated. We know that the constant exposure to your friends' carefully curated positive portrayals of their life can leave you to feel inadequate and can increase rates of depression. And something I think we're going to be hearing more about in the near future is that there's a fundamental mismatch between the way our brains are wired and this behavior of exposing yourself to stimuli with intermittent rewards throughout all of your waking hours. So it's one thing to spend a couple hours at the slot machine in Las Vegas, but if you bring a slot machine with you and you pull that handle all day long from when you wake up to when you go to bed, we're not wired from it. It short circuits the brain and we're starting to find that it has actual cognitive consequences, one of them being this sort of pervasive background hum of anxiety. Here's the thing. The world we live in isn't real. Social media isn't real. And by design, social media rewards us for showing our best life. The edited, posed, champagne, Michelin star, holiday, orchestrated best angle of our life, the highlight reel. But you don't ever see real life, the 99% of our lives, the behind the scenes, the unglamorous, unfiltered, day-to-day, -day bland normality. And you end up comparing your behind the scenes to other people's fake highlight reel and using others as a mirror or benchmark for how you should look, how successful you should be, or how you should live. These fake comparisons will only serve to make you feel inadequate and inferior to something that isn't even real. Research continually shows that comparing your life to someone else's creates envy, low self-confidence, low self-esteem, and depression. You compare yourself to other people every single day, consciously or subconsciously, and no matter what I say, you're not going to stop because comparing one thing to another is a natural human thing to do. Whether we want to admit it or not, a big reason why anything has value is because there's something worse or better to compare it to. Think about it. An old brick of a mobile phone with a big aerial is only considered amazing in a world before the smartphone. The horse and carriage is only considered a phenomenal mode of transport until the car comes along. The answer isn't to stop making comparisons because unfortunately we can't control that. But you have to change the object of your comparison from someone else to yourself. You have to measure yourself against yourself. And by doing this you start at a base point where you consider yourself to be perfectly fine exactly how you are. But it also is the most effective, motivating and healthy way to work to improve yourself. You'll become your happiest self when you stop putting pressure on yourself to be more like someone else and when you start comparing real to real. We are in a really bad state of affairs right now in my opinion. It is it is eroding the core foundations of how people behave by and between each other. Um and I don't have a good solution. You know, my solution is I just don't use these tools anymore. I haven't for years. It's created huge tension with my friends, huge tensions in my social circles. Um if you look at like, you know, my Facebook feed, I probably haven't I posted maybe two times in 7 years. Three times, five times. It's like just it's less than 10. Um and it's weird. I guess I kind of just innately didn't want to get programmed, and so I just turned tuned it out. But I didn't confront it. And now to see what's happening It's really it really it really bums me up. Back in the 1970s and the early 80s uh, at Xerox Park when Steve Jobs first went over and saw the graphical user interface, 
the way people talked about influenced the computers world. and Hello, what computers were I supposed to be was uh, a bicycle for our minds. That um, here we are, you, you take a human being and they have a certain set of capacities and capabilities. And then you give them a bicycle and they can go to all these new distances. They're empowered to go to these brand new places and to do these new things, to have these new capacities. And um, that's always been the philosophy of people who make technologies. How do we uh, create bicycles for our minds to do and empower us to feel and, and access more? Now, when the first iPhone was introduced, it was also the philosophy of these the technologies. How do we empower people to do something more? And, what, and in those days, it wasn't manipulative because there was no competition for attention. Photoshop wasn't trying to maximize how much attention it took from you. It didn't measure its success that way. Um, and the internet overall had been in the very beginning uh, not designed to maximize attention. It was just of putting things out there, putting things out there, creating these message boards. It wasn't designed with this whole persuasive psychology that emerged later. If you feed the beast, that beast will destroy you. If you push back on it, we have a chance to control it and rein it in. And it is a point in time where people need to hard break from some of these tools and the things that you rely on. The short-term dopamine-driven feedback loops that we have created are destroying how society works. No civil discourse, no cooperation, misinformation, mistruth. And it's not an American problem. This is not about Russian ads. This is a global problem. Mr. Zuckerberg, would you be comfortable sharing with us the name of the hotel you stayed in last night? Um, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs>